Hi, I'm Bryony Robinson, a barrister at Ten Old Square specialising in chancery practice, and here are my top unresolved points in trust law. Purchases from a joint account. Where money is contributed into an account by spouses, the presumption is that there is a joint beneficial ownership of the monies in that account. One might be forgiven, therefore, for assuming that any property purchased using joint monies would also be subject to that joint beneficial ownership. However, that's just not the case. Ree Bishop says that where the, both spouses have the ability to draw monies from the joint account, they can purchase chattels in their own name for their sole beneficial use. This seems unfair. It's been doubted in the Canadian Supreme Court case of uh, Rathwell and Rathwell, which says that essentially it's a race to the bank. The trustee who gets to the bank first is entitled to appropriate all the monies in the joint account to purchase that chattel. This is clearly an area that the law needs to review. Mutual wills. The principle behind mutual wills is simple. The parties agree by way of a contract at law that the wills will be irrevocable and will be subject to remaining unaltered. Upon the death of the first spouse, a floating trust arises which then crystallises on the death of the second spouse. There are a number of outstanding issues with mutual wills, but a particular one is the extent to which the survivor is entitled to distribute and spend the assets of the first to die. Now, the Australian case of Birmingham and Renfrew says that if the survivor has been bequeathed the property absolutely, then they're entitled to spend it as they choose. This is, however, subject to a provision that they must not create settlements or intervivos gifts, otherwise that forms a breach of trust. However, there is conflicting Australian authority that says, actually, if you've been given the property absolutely, why can't you make intervivos gifts? In that situation, it's only gifts of a testamentary character that would be considered a breach of trust. But what about the situation where the survivor is recklessly spending the money that he has been bequeathed by the first to die? Can that be considered a breach of trust? On one viewpoint, he's been given it absolutely and so can spend it as he chooses. But surely the better argument is that if he's intending by such expenditure to defeat the purpose of the agreement, then in actual fact that ought to be considered to be a breach of trust. This is an issue that needs further consideration. Constructive trust and proprietary estoppel. When considering a case for the first time, it can be difficult to tell whether you have a proprietary estoppel claim or a constructive trust claim on your hands. In actual fact, these are commonly pleaded in the alternative, but is there really a difference? The short answer to this is yes. Lord Walker in Stack and Dowden has explained that a proprietary estoppel claim is a claim against the true owner of the property and it involves a mere equity and to be satisfied, the court must give the minimum award necessary to do justice. By comparison, a constructive trust claim involves establishing who the true beneficial owners of the property are and what their shares are. However, this distinction might be eroded if the concept of a remedial constructive trust is accepted by English case law. At present, it's been decided that English case law has not as yet accepted a remedial constructive trust, but the door has been left open by Stack and Dowden. In actual fact, if a remedial constructive trust is accepted by English case law, then the remedy would be very similar to that of proprietary estoppel. And this is an evolving area of trust law. Thank you for listening. Those were my top unresolved points of trust law. If you'd like to know more, please come along to the London Trust Conference on the 7th of June.